Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on our September 17th edition of THCB Gang, episode 25. I'm Zoya Khan, the editor-in-chief of the Healthcare Blog, and today we've got a great show for you with a great guest lineup. First off, we have Ken Ballard. He is the he was one of the Extincture Health Editor, and he now writes regularly for the Healthcare Blog. Grace Cordovano, she's a board certified patient advocate and the CEO of, en of Enlightening Results. She does a lot of patient advocacy work. She's coming out of New Jersey. Rosemary Day, she's our guest for the evening. She's the CEO of Day Health Strategist, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about what she does on in her day job during the show. Vince Kuretis, he's the principal at Better Health Technologies, great policy and health tech expert, been in the industry for a very long time. Devin McGraw, she's the chief regulatory officer at Citizen, used to be a lawyer on the Hill and now has joined the private sector out of the Bay Area. So we'll be hearing a little bit about everyone from everybody. Uh, so here we go. Hey, gang. How are you guys? Zoya. Hi, Zoya. Hi, Zoya. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. I know we have a very, I know we didn't go live today, so we're recording. And for our listeners on the podcast show, um, you'll be actually the first ones to see this and hear this. So um, thank you so much again, gang, for joining us and for being flexible with our technical difficulties. Um, so to sort of start off, I kind of want to hear from what everybody has see, been seeing in the industry um, from their perspectives. I know we've had a lot going on, especially with the elections coming up, especially with sort of the divide between now it's leftist versus liberal versus right versus conservative. So uh, obviously a lot going on in that sector as well as the health tech sector um, with all the funding deals. So how about to start, uh, start us off, Vince, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Zoe. Thanks. I'd, I'd like to frame an issue that's gotten on my radar screen. I, I hope, uh, hint, hint, hope we can take some time to discuss it among our group because there's a lot of perspectives here. It's an issue relating to telehealth, and I'm going to use an old used framework to frame this as what we're seeing is the irresistible force versus the immovable object. Uh, the irresistible force being how patients are reacting to telehealth. They love it. Every survey I've seen shows uh, 80 to 90 percent satisfaction, 90 percent want to reuse it. The net promoter scores are off the chart. Uh, and interestingly, there was a report released just within the last couple of days, uh, co-authored by NCQA, the Alliance for Connected Health, and the American Telemedicine Association. And they frame telehealth really as, from the evidence they've seen, it improves quality and it actually is not increasing in cost. So that's, that's the irresistible force moving ahead. Now, what I'm seeing... Uh, also is the immovable object, or as Matthew and I, who have known each other for a long time, have phrased it as sort of the, the old normal, the status quo, the idea that the healthcare system is really organized for the benefit of providers and not for the convenience of, of patients. So let me, let me give you some uh, bullet points on that side, where uh, we did see huge spikes in volume in April, uh, a recent stat news survey citing Epic users said 69% of visits down to 21%. And just this last week, uh, I saw a really interesting survey of physicians saying 58% of them are, are concerned and have quality issues or concerns around telehealth. Then there's all the uncertainties around uh, will there be relaxation or continuing relaxation of the regs. What about reimbursement for Medicare? Now we have parity. And uh, I think provide, if I were a provider, I'd be going, hey, this is a whole new level of competition. I'm not sure I want this in my town. So, you know, I'm framing it as, you know, the, the irresistible force and the immovable object, not at all clear how that's going to come out in the wash. But but certainly a very topical issue that I'm seeing this week. Thanks, Zoya. 
Yeah, no, Vince, ex I, exactly what you're saying is sort of this telemed the telemedicine uptake with patients has been so great. And um, even with the, uh, we're seeing the elder population, I know my grandma keeps, you know, going onto her phone and, you know, calls her doctor whenever she wants, you know, about her medicines or, you know, even just such as, you know, my knees are hurting, am I okay? She had knee replacement surgery. So I know that the uptake of telemedicine has been huge amongst sort of the older crowd as well as millennials and now Gen Zers. Um, so yeah, definitely would love to chat about that more during our call. Um, Grace, oh, what are you seeing? Did anybody, someone gonna comment? No? Oh, Rosemary, you were gonna say something? Yeah, go ahead. So, um I think that's a super interesting set of points. Um, I would just add that um, I don't think we should paint providers as kind of like with one broad brush, obviously, because there's so much diversity amongst types of providers, right? Ag agreed. I'm seeing kind of two factions emerge. The, the ones who have the mindset of let's push the boundaries and do this as much as we can versus uh, kind of the old guard. There's definitely yeah. contingencies there. And, you know, I reside in a big city area, which is kind of one whole, you know, reality, but we're, our, my firm is doing a lot of work um, on telehealth for rural populations and vulnerable populations um, kind of combined. And we're um, working with some colleagues in Puerto Rico, for example, um, that just continues to face devastation. And so looking at tremendous opportunities to really advance with telehealth as long as you know the reimbursement mechanisms can keep working but um, I, I think that that actually is for the convenience of the providers and the patients it's almost like the win-win when you look at that kind of um, system and population. Yeah and I think to bridge off of that a little bit Grace while we were offline you were talking about clinicians not even having email or you know technology uses for sending over a simple patient record. So what are you sort of seeing? What are your thoughts on all of this? So it, I, I, that's got to be lies. I, I don't understand how that's possible. We've been virtual for six months. So backstory is I was on the phone setting up a new patient appointment for someone. They needed imaging. This was great. There's going to be a virtual visit. They wanted to send, you know, um, paperwork, intake paperwork, par for the course, and they were going to hard copy mail it. And I just said, can you please email me? and very seriously said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We don't have email. And I, I don't understand, how is that possible? And why can't we email forms? So I, um, I guess we're gonna wait 10 days for the mail to come and we're going to hard copy mail and I guess we're gonna have to mail it back because there doesn't seem to be any other form of communication, I'm not sure. Um, what did I see this week? Uh, Devin, I'm so happy you're here because I thought there was a lot of excitement with like patient access uh, topics. Uh, Pew Trust had an interesting survey that came out yesterday, I believe, and showing that yes, patients want greater access and they do have privacy concerns. So uh, we need to do this the right way and gain trust. So I think that there's some really juicy information in that survey and OCR settled five cases. So there's some teeth coming to this information blocking rules. Um, I thought the fines were a little low, but I may be biased, but we're moving in the right direction and we have 46 days until November 2nd, which is when we hit the ground running. Yeah, Devin, what do you want to say about everything? <laughs> Well, thank you, Grace. This is a, that was an amazing uh, tee up of some topics, obviously that that that, that we care about. Um, you know, I'll say I'll say first on the OCR fines. People may remember that OCR gave itself a haircut with respect to maximum penalties. This they the penalties were increased by Congress in the High Tech Act, but they were increased in ranges. And OCR willingly took the step through um, an announcement in the Federal Register that they would interpret high tech to, to give them less penalty authority than pro pre their predecessors had interpreted high tech to give them. The, the le legislative language is very confusing. In that circumstance, the regulators have a lot of room to decide how they're going to interpret their authority, and they decided to basically give themselves a haircut. So that you'll see, you're, you're going to start to see out of OCR, these settlements are going to come in at lower penalty levels than the sort of whoppers that we have seen over the past several years as enforcement has ticked up. 
I, you know, I would say that, that, that that's concerning, but, but what I have gotten some, um, what has made me feel a bit better about this enforcement activity is one, that it's happening. And number two, that they, each case comes with a um, corrective action plan, which those, I haven't looked at the ones in the most recent cases, but those have actually been super robust. And, you know, frankly, if I were a provider on the other side of that, I would not be happy. It's, you know, it's basically OCR over your shoulder, like, send me every request. We want to see how you're re uh, responding to it. We want to see your policies. We're going to approve your policies, all of that stuff. So, you know, the, the other development that I will mention is, you know, the Wall Street Journal had an article about how HIPAA doesn't cover all health data. Duh. But again, the Wall Street Journal has had multiple pieces on this. So I actually should be glad that they continue to harp on this. Um, and there also was a new sort of voluntary framework that came out of what I think is a very interesting combination of of uh, nonprofit organizations, EHI, the eHealth Initiative, which has traditionally been an organization of healthcare uh, providers and plans and you know, traditional healthcare system actors, along with the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT, which is an organization that I used to work for, which is very strong consumer privacy advocates. So they came together, brought a bunch of stakeholders to the table and pounded out a framework that, that frankly works fairly well as a legislative blueprint but they were initially proposing it as something that could also be voluntarily attested to. So that might be something that we could talk more about. If there's yeah, something. no, definitely. And um, a quick question that just comes to mind. So Grace was saying, you know, this is, we're still, even though the fines aren't maybe the greatest, we're still moving in the right direction. Do you agree with that sentiment as well? Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to move in the right direction because as Grace mentioned, you know, additional penalty authorities, at least with respect to certified EHR vendors, providers, and HIEs come onto the table with the info blocking rules. We, we still don't have that enforcement rule out of OIG, so we don't know when the penalties are going to start attaching around HIEs and, and, and EHRs. But, but that's definitely the trajectory that we're going on. So, so sort of failure to pay attention to this issue and continuing to have you know, sort of policies and processes for record release to patients that are behind the times, not in compliance with HIPAA, not in compliance with the information blocking rules is going to increasingly get you into um, some pretty significant hot water. Yeah, so. definitely. Um, Kim, what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, uh, when I was, when Vince was talking, I was thinking about, you know, I feel as though this is a bit of a deja vu. That I'm, I'm a big believer in telehealth, but I think back to when retail health clinics were introduced. They were also going to revolutionize convenience and lower costs, but the healthcare system has just sort of absorbed them and made them part of our, our cost structure. So while I'm, I'm a big believer and a big advocate, I'm hesitant to think that they're actually going to change the, you know, lower our costs in any significant way. I would point out that I think it was Kaiser of uh, Washington State introduced their virtual first uh, health plan. And I'm not quite clear whether, so that you, your first your first point of contact is supposed to be virtual and, and then you can go in person if you choose. Mm -hmm. I'm not clear whether that has any teeth or whether it's really just a marketing gimmick, but it does show that, you know, people are really taking this seriously in particular Kaiser that's been doing this for a long time to make that a, a, a sales point instead of just a uh, nice to have sort of a feature. Yeah, I almost, so my, my tidbit on that is I was trying to get a COVID test. We were, we were, you know, we had a little bit of a scare and all the private industry and like the retail markets like CVS Minute Clinic were all saying, we'll get a video visit first and then you can go get, um, a, you know, you can get a test, but it's going to take five to seven days. And then the public San Francisco clinic was kind of like, no, you don't need a video test. What are your symptoms? Come in. Yeah, we'll get your test to you in four, 24 to 48 hours. And I got my results in 30 hours. So I don't even, I'm still trying to figure out this whole like video screening, the telemedicine component to how we're applying it to our system today. Um, Rosemary, I know you were speaking a little bit about kind of not sort of painting providers as this one generic, you know, block. What are your, what are you seeing? What are your thoughts? So I'm, you know, I think about when I talk about vulnerable populations and community health centers um, and and smaller practices that are that are um, serving rural areas. Um, they, you know, the, the ability to do things uh, via telehealth um, for managing chronic conditions and obviously mental health and and um, a number of different categories opens up so many possibilities um, for increasing access. Um, and you know that's 
really, really important. Um, so we're, what we're finding is that, you know, it's one thing <laughs> to say, we want to do this and they want like the technology you know, solutions to be good, but it's actually needing to change all of your, um, your basic practices, um, you know, in terms of just your workflow. There's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen um, that is around, I guess, the softer side. It's not obviously not just a technology solution. So we're, we're finding that that's actually the obstacle. So there are patients who want it and then even the providers want to do it, but then you've got to get, you've got to get there. And, um, and that's a little more challenging, I think, especially when you're dealing with rural populations. Oh, definitely. Um, I think I saw Grace nodding to that. So um, I know I gave a little bit of an intro real quick, but Grace is, does a lot of work with um, patients and does a lot of advocacy work. Grace, what are your thoughts on what Rosemary is saying and sort of reaching vulnerable populations? I know your stories are kind of, you know, from what you're seeing are kind of lining up. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm fascinated with this whole debate about telehealth and everybody panicking about it going down. And I guess from the patient and care partner perspective, we don't see it necessarily as a replacement for all, all in-person care, but rather it's an additional tool that we can use to connect with our care team. And I think it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's filling in the massive gaps that were present that nobody really cared about, um, but it's really powerful in the right situations. Chronic illness, um, life altering, life limiting diagnoses, disability, multiple comorbidities. That's where you have multiple touch points and having the availability, especially now where there's areas that have this pandemic surging, where there are cases where there is sheltering in place, where kids are home, where you can't physically go to a doctor's office, perhaps. Um, I think this is fantastic absolutely for the rural populations. So I don't know for you, we're looking through the right lens as to how people are actually using telehealth and for what purposes. Um, you know, there's this announcement about the Halo uh, competitor that entered, entered the market, which is going to be able to record and tell you about your sentiment and if you were kind of a grouch today. And you know, I'd, I, if, when I have time, um, I'd love to write a piece because really what I would like um, is a band. I'd love for my doctor to prescribe me a band to record all of the disasters with healthcare that go on so I could record and they can analyze that sentiment, build me a nice little word, word cloud and maybe analyze on a system level everything they're doing wrong that they need to improve. I don't need another t thing telling me um, to censor my call. I feel like as a female, it's now a technology telling me smile more. You have such a pretty smile. You really should smile more. I, I think we're missing an opportunity and looking for the wrong thing. Great, Grace, I feel that they would need a special bracelet for people that live in New Jersey, though, wouldn't they? Oh, okay, we might need two. I'd, I'd but like we would use it. We would tell you everything. We really would tell you everything. And I think that's in this whole sentiment analysis and listening. We're missing the boat. If you sent a patient home or a loved one that has to deal with all this nonsense from trying to get their records, from not being able to get an appointment, and the whole spectrum of, of fragmentation, I think you would learn a lot and get an earful from listening to that. The thing that I would add to what Rose, Rosemary and Grace have said that, you know, the thing I would worry about is that many of the most vulnerable populations, the rural populations, low income, you know, elderly, are the least likely to use technology to the extent that other people do. So if we're going to really get at these populations, we got to figure out how we make technology available and accessible to them, not just, you know, have it there and assume that they're going to you know, adopt it the way that, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, middle class uh, people comfortable with technology uh, might do it. But a lot of the care partners will use it. What about the children that are navigating health care for their immigrant families that yeah. have limited English proficiency? I was one of those kids. So I have to push back and say, you know what, um, especially now in this pandemic, the younger generation and a lot of elderly are insulted when you say that they don't use technology. Their grandkids are teaching them how to do it. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's true of some people, but I don't think you'd make a statement that that's true of all elderly people. So yeah. I, elderly people are, are more familiar with technology than many people would grant them. But, you know, uh, there are things that I need to ask help for. And, you know, I don't consider myself that old. So it, it, things, things come in waves and people, you know, people get used to dealing with certain kinds of technology and new technologies scare some people. And some people, you know, again, we're seeing this with the schools. 
Some people do not have access to broadband, do not have access to devices in the same way that other people do. So it, 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 there is unequal access to technology in America, and we can't ignore that. So to bridge off of that, um, Mike McGee had this really great piece on THCB about how Medicare, uh, there's Medicaid policies that are basically, they're structurally set up to be very um, discriminatory towards black Americans and how they even access it. So they can only access Medicaid towards the end of their life and that you can always, you can, he said basically go look at nursing homes and that's where you'll find a lot of the black Americans that are finally eligible for Medicaid and you know it's towards the end of their life so I mean you know kind of hearing what everybody's talking about in terms of vulnerable populations does it even it starts sort of at this policy structure of redefining how to even bring those dollars into these communities is kind of what my thoughts are. Devin, but, are you going to say something? Yeah, go yeah I was going to say I mean it, that's also the face of poverty right like Medicaid has been a program that was not just means tested but also um, uh, uh, skews towards children, mm -hmm. um, and then and then for adults, you you know it's not just a means test. There are other tests you have to meet too, which means it's not just a program for all poor people. So that means you spend down to get Medicaid coverage in order to be able to afford to be in a nursing home covered by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this is even something that my you know my white you know not affluent but but not poor grandmother had to do. Like at the end of her life, she basically had to spend everything she had in order to be able to have nursing home care. So that, I mean, that's not surprising. I mean, that, that's both a, a picture of, un, you know, disparities in America, but also, and, 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 but it's also a picture of the Medicaid program, which so often gets sort of painted as though it's, it, it's the savior program, but there are so many rules that keep people who, who could, um, who could and should be able to access it ideally from being able to until they're at this point where they're probably spending a lot more money than they would have had we gotten them care um, earlier in their lifetime. Last I looked, there were still 12 states that had not expanded Medicaid. So right. they still have the archaic yeah. rules about you know eligibility. And it's been a while since I looked at it, but pre-ACA, I believe that there were some states that did not even have a means-tested eligibility. So Medicaid is a, you know, it can work well to protect people, but it is a mess of a program. Yeah. I, I will take the optimistic view, again, perhaps counter to sometimes the way I present things. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's an opportunity here really to, to reduce disparities through technology. You know, let's teach people how to use telehealth. Uh, you can use your phone. Uh, you don't have to come into the doctor's office. Uh, you know, will we see policy and reimbursement uh, supporting that kind of thinking. I mean, that's to be determined in, from what I'm seeing. I think back to, uh, so some of you may remember when we used to talk about M health or E health, and somebody said back then, you know, when we stop calling it M health or E health and just call it health, then we know. Yeah. It's and I think we're going to be at the same place with telehealth. You know, it shouldn't be a one off. It shouldn't be a, you know, a specialized tool in a different bag of tricks. It should be part of the bag of tricks and incorporated into the practice of medicine. Uh, generally. So we're not at that point yet, but that's where we need to get to. Let me, from my vantage point, having spent a lot of time in the in the depths of the delivery system, there's some real subtleties here. Uh, and let me give you an example. I read a tweet from a cardiologist. He was responding to a question from Chrissy Farr about, you know, are you seeing interest in telehealth? And his answer was, you know, 5% of my patients are interested in this. And I just scratched my head, you know, where, you know, the subtleties are where a clinician potentially can say, well, you really ought to come into the office or don't you want to come into the office, you know, where very subtle phrasing is going to make a huge difference in how this ultimately plays out. And, you know, to me, at least that was evidence of the old guard. I, I had a hard time believing only 5% of his patients really wanted to do telehealth. It's sort, of the, it's sort of the priming language that he's using and kind of introducing difficulties around it. Uh, Rosemary, I know you were, you were trying to say something as well. Oh, I just, I wanted to make the point Kim did about the fact there's 12 states that have not expanded Medicaid. Um, 
And perhaps um, not surprisingly, a number of those states are in the South. And so if we're talking about African Americans who've not been able to access Medicaid, um, that is, uh, and, and a large uh, share of African Americans still do live in the South. Um, I think that's your answer right there. Um, so it's, I consider it to be outrageous at this point that states would not have taken the federal deal under Affordable Care Act to expand Medicaid. Um, and I will do everything until my dying breath to uh, make the case for it. I'll join you. <laughs> We all will. Yeah. Bravo. So just to give an example of the states that had not expanded, 11 of those states um, provide no coverage for childless adults, and they provided Medicaid only to parents who earned less than $10,000 per year. So the Affordable Care Act was trying to raise that floor to about to you know 138 percent of the federal poverty level, which is around 29, 30,000 for that family of three. So that gap between the 10,000 and the 29,000 is what we're talking about. I mean, that's an annual income for a family of three. When I give those numbers to people, you know, their jaws drop. I've been working in states that are trying to figure out how to expand Medicaid and they didn't real, oh, is it that bad? Well, yes, it's that bad. You have to be extremely poverty stricken. Like, well, And Rosemary, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of those programs have extremely limited benefit programs too. You know, limits on the number of hospital days, limits on drugs, all that kind of stuff. So even if you get the coverage, it may prove to be illusory about, you know, if you get really sick, you're out of luck. But at least you would start to have some access. And so this whole point about telehealth, that's only valid if you've even got the ticket to entry, which is some modest form of coverage to begin well, with. Some, some good news, bad news. That, you know, that I just saw an article that, you know, in fact, the uh, Medicaid rolls are swelling in the states, you know, so it's, it's serving its purpose. But the bad news is that's a huge burden on the state's budgets, uh, particularly in a time when the states are hard cut. And as Ian Morrison points out in some of the other things, that's a huge hit on most of the uh, hospitals uh, and doctors' income because Medicaid reimbursement is much below what private pay is. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's good for the patients, but it's terrible for the people that are funding it or getting paid by it. Right. I mean, Medicaid's always counter cyclical. I mean, it, right. Yeah. So that's, that's just the reality of ec the economics of the Medicaid program. But last I checked, we're a pretty wealthy country. So it's really, <laughs> well, except, except, unless you consider our debt. Um, it's a quite, and I'm a numbers and budget person by, by training. I mean, it's about budgeting is really about values and priorities. And so we could find the money if we chose to find the money. And, it's, and it goes back to the point, so we're seeing all of these health tech deals get done, right? There's, you know, last month there was, I think, four to five days, it was consecutive $100 million deals done. We saw the Livongo and Teladoc merger, which I know has been blasted through everybody's Twitter, but I'm still getting updates about it. Uh, today, I'm watching, like, billions, million, you know, just being thrown at solutions. But are these solutions really, you know, pushing the needle and sort of pushing us forward in healthcare, especially, you know, I wanted to pick up a little bit about Grace's point on children being, or maybe they're not on their kids, being the first one, the first sort of line of defense for their parents when they're entering the healthcare field or when they're talking to doctors or they're, when they're, you know, reconciling their parents' prescriptions. What is the impact on kids what is the impact on their sort of mental health? And where does even, where does this all even come into play when we're talking about, you know, accessing communities who's, we're just assuming they're sick, but you know, is sickness also, is also mental health, behavioral health, all of that stuff involved. What are, what are some thoughts on that? Well, if, I, if I'm a local provider, I'm probably gonna have very mixed reactions about that. Uh, you know, another another uh, deal, uh, Google said they're going to be investing $100 million. And uh, Matthew just flashed a, uh, a message saying Amwell went public today. Uh, I hadn't heard that, but boy, that was quick because I just read their, their S1 statement earlier in the week. And, uh, and now they're doing their IPO. This is a whole new level of, of competition for, for uh 
for local doctors and local providers. The, the default used to be my local doctor, and it ain't that way anymore today. Right, right. Well, to, to Grace's point, so I've written about Twitch and TikTok and uh, Fortnite because those children, those, that's the kind of technologies that they're using and that they're used to. And when they get involved in the healthcare system, it's, it goes, it's like Grace's point about not having email. Like, they're like, you got to be kidding me. This is, this is what we're dealing with. And so, you know, at some point, the healthcare system is going to have a reckoning that that is the kind of thinking and uh, sophistication that the users are going to be dealing with. And the healthcare system is not ready for that. And, and Kim, you had an interesting piece about how um, on THCB about how Twitch, uh, you know, chess has gone on yes. Twitch. And chess is this very, you know, in-person, very integrative, very, you know, just like an intellectual game that's played between two players. And now suddenly it's virtual and people are still playing. I mean, why is healthcare not even, I mean, we are there in some ways, like in telehealth solutions, but they were really not there in other parts of the industry. Um, Devin, did you, did you have a comment on that? Well, I mean, I, I just think it goes back to sort of a, a, a theme that we had earlier, which is, you know, telehealth is another tool in the toolbox. That, I, I, that folks put it really well when they made that point. It is not the be all and end all. We have this tendency, I think, in healthcare to look at these solutions as though if they're not solving all of our problems, they're not working, right? Instant gratification, Devin, instant gratification. Well, it, it sort of makes me think of blockchain, which, you know, we haven't had a call in a while where somebody used the word blockchain, oh, yeah. right? The savior of all things, interoperability, blockchain, like that, that's what's all going to make it all work. How about that? What, 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 what did you say? Transparency is another one of my favorites. Transparency. Mine is those machine learning, artificial intelligence, and blockchain will solve healthcare. Yeah. And good luck. So look, Meanwhile, we have fax machines everywhere and pagers and clipboards with paper. Yeah. No email. I'm not impressed. No, no, no email. email. No. And no email. Yes. So, so behind in lots of ways in the ways that we should be getting up up to speed bringing healthcare in in into alignment with the rest of of, of the digital economy um but we can't look at I, you cannot replace the human touch for everything mm -hmm. right i got my flu shot the other day this is the earliest i've ever gotten a seasonal flu shot obviously that's not a telehealth service you got to go get one but i got one uh and it was easy and they were organized and and that, that's just one tiny example of like how do you make things easier for people? Telehealth is one of those things that makes it easier for people, but it works for some things and not for other things. I think, Devin, you picked up on an interesting point of being more efficient and more concise in how you're delivering your, like what you were just saying about a flu shot. And I want to go back to, again, when I was getting a COVID shot, or not, not a shot, oh my gosh. Somewhere I remember reading in the last week, some pharmacy is going to set up uh, an online drive through your car, get a flu shot. Not Why entirely not? virtual, but you don't have to go into the drugstore. Like a machine something? <sighs> I don't know. That, well, I'm sending you that one. But I was saying in terms of what, you know, going to the city clinic and getting, it was so fast. It was so cheap. I mean, it would, you know, it was, you know, I, it, it took me 30 minutes to walk over there. I think it was, you could give a donation if you wanted to, to help like, you know, other people get tested. That's when I said cheap, it was like two to $3. I donated, you know, they, that you were all in line. You, everybody was far apart from each other. It was outside and it was just this pop-up clinic. Whereas when I was calling my provider, you know, I was calling Carbon Health, they're like, oh, yeah, we can fit you in. It's going to take seven days to get your results. It's like seven days? That's a very long time. Seven days for my private insurance. And so I was kind of like, why can't we make these, these processes a little bit more efficient? Not remove, or how do we enhance the human touch? And I know we've been kind of saying like, <coughs> medicine this that what is how are how are some ways that we can what Devin was saying is enhance human touch and kind of use everything in our toolbox uh, rosemary do you do you have any thoughts on that um, well I think it's um, 
I think that the technology tools can give um, care, I think Grace, you said, is it caregiving partners, um, care partners who, um, who are there, you know, and are providing some human touch, they can be the link to the expertise that's in the healthcare system so that, so that they can focus on the important things that they can handle in person. Um, you know, and I'm thinking of my elderly parents um, in, in this regard, and and the benefit they get from that human touch. But those caregivers don't have all the medical expertise. But if they're teamed and have very easy access um, to either the hospice care team or um, the you know the Kaiser uh, team that has geriatric specialty, that makes a really great. It, when it all works it can be amazing, even in a time of COVID, especially in a time of COVID when you're trying not to be transporting really frail people into a hotspot. <laughs> so. There's a dichotomy here that I've written about before that uh, I don't think people have really thought through very much. That, yes, I, I very much agree that the human touch is important, but at the same time, we, we prize our physicians and other healthcare professionals for their, their deep knowledge. Well, at some point, that deep knowledge is going to be done by AI, machine learning, whatever. And at that point, so are we? Are physicians going to be the place where we get the empathy and the touch, or are they are, are they going to be where we go to get the expertise because they won't be uniquely valued for that? And do we do we pay physicians as much when their role is more for the empathy than mm -hmm. it is for the knowledge that they bring? So we're, we're going to have a we're going to have this parting of the ways at some point, and I don't think we are. You know, certainly physicians are not ready for us to do that. And I don't think we as patients are ready for to do that. But the AI isn't going to replace most physicians. It's going to enhance and allow them to practice even more at the top of their license. If anything, I would be hesitant to say that we're going to knock out entire squads of professions, especially when we have a shortage of physicians in many specialties, especially geriatrics in our aging population. Uh, I'm not sure that some, some physicians are going to be able to practice at the top of their profession because Again, another thing we've not really grappled with is that not all physicians are good. We, we've never really gotten to the point that, you know, most physicians are by definition average and a big chunk of them are below average and we don't do anything about that. And that's a problem. And that's as, as we get other ways to get care and get information about our care, that's going to become more exposed. And what are we prepared to do about that? Well, I'll, I'll speak as a technology advocate here. I've been around the telehealth field for a long time. The first consulting client uh, that what brought me a telehealth project was back in 2001. So I've watched this for a long time. You know, the question I'll pose to all of you is what is the, I mean, take an optimistic viewpoint. What is, what's the potential of what we could do through technology and, and telehealth? And a, a person I would point to, I suspect most of you are going to know him, is John Halamka who's now head of the, of the Mayo healthcare platform of a physician. And uh, he talked, I heard him recently talking about the potential of the Mayo platform. And he acknowledges your, your point, Kim, of, you know, that, that there's still a lot of value for human touch. But then he points to the idea of studies that have pointed out where you get the wrong diagnosis through human touch. So if you take on that kind of a mindset, uh, you know, I'll, I'll end where I started of, I don't think we have any clue what the potential here can be. And it really is, that's where the, the idea of digital first to me uh, makes a lot of sense and what Kaiser is trying to accomplish with their, with their new health plan in, in Washington. That really resonates with me, be, excuse me, because I was misdiagnosed with advanced lymphoma. My scans, had there been an AI algorithm, maybe it would have saved me four months going through Sloan Kettering, and maybe we would have nailed down if I didn't need all these tests, imaging, biopsy, biopsy, biopsies that have failed, surgery, being placed in isolation after surgery for tuberculosis, um, finding out it was a fungal infection that I had acquired on my honeymoon two years prior, and mm -hmm. this situation didn't need any treatment just monitoring um, because a healthy immune system clears in of itself so what you're saying resonates with me um, I wish they had an AI algorithm and what about the other people that go through this that it's didn't get the second opinion I got a second opinion what if I didn't what if I panicked and hit the ground running and said let's start treatment 
It's the old question. Do you want the surgeon that has the best bedside manner or do you want the surgeon with the best technical skills? And when that surgeon is an AI or a robot, that changes the whole complexion entirely. So I, I, going back to Vince's point, I think that telehealth will not really hit its stride until the first interactions on telehealth is with a, an avatar of some sort, a, a, you know, a bot of some sort. So that, you know, what Babylon is trying to do in England or whatever, they're not there yet. I'll, I'll grant you that fully. But at some point, you know, people want access to information and advice right away where they are in their home. Right now, we're now finally realizing that we can do that on the phone, on video or whatever with a person. We're going to find out within the next 10 years that we can do that with something that's not a person. And for many people, that will be okay. And the next step may be then doing it online with a person, and the, or the next step may be then going to see a person. But the first step, which will take care of half of most interactions probably, will be sort of auto, uh, some sort of automated intelligent response. You know, that's going to change the way that the FDA regulates these types of tools because today much of the way that they draw their lines around what they want to sort of focus on from a device perspective with respect to software is the is stuff that 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 makes decisions without human inter intervention with that without a doctor intervening and it's not just advising the doctor it's actually making the decision and telling the the patient what the treatment is or, or administering the patient without a doctor's intervention that will change the dynamic for the fda in terms of how they how they regulate these tools i, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago ai doctors are going to need some ai lawyers <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kim, exactly. I, I know that we that was a little bit of a joke, but I mean, exactly that. So, who? So, when Tesla was coming out with these automated cars, everybody was like, "If this gets into an accident, is it on Tesla or is it on the driver?" And so, then there was this whole push of the person who is not touching the handle but is not driving but is in the car is responsible. But that still goes back and forth of. Is it the AI or is it the driver that crashed? So same with in healthcare, if we're going to have these AI doctor decision makers or you know, even second opinion um, technology solutions, where does all of the legal and sort of political work around that kind of what, what, what happens there? We haven't Talk figured out how to do malpractice with human physicians correctly yet. You know, we've turned it into something where it, it, admitting and exposing mistakes is you know, a bad thing. So, but AI has got, to, has got to do the opposite of that. We have to know exactly what happened, exactly what went wrong and, and try to fix that. So our systems of, of malpractice and oversight are not at all ready for this dysomy. And we don't have patient education materials to inform the patient that there are algorithms on the back end that are guiding these decisions. Because we know from previous reports and studies that there's bias that's inadvertently introduced to these and they can significantly and impact care, especially for vulnerable populations. On the other hand, we don't, we don't tell them about what implicit and explicit biases their physicians have either. Right. You know? We don't tell them about financial arrangements we, yeah. between physicians and health plans. We don't, yeah. <laughs> so much to, your, to your example, Zoya, the, the Tesla example, every, every time that we've seen uh, you know, automated cars unfortunately hurt or kill someone, it's front page news. What about the other, you know, 30 or 40,000 people who die in automobile accidents because humans are driving every year? I, but I expect we're probably going to see the same pattern in healthcare. You know, anytime we see an AI mistake, it's probably going to be front page news. Yeah, and I think, and I, and I even, you know, when you see that and when you hear those, things we're all human we're all focused on this you know the machine is bad even telemedicine pickup is you know is was originally looked at as like something evil like removing the doctor but in, in fact it actually enhanced and the uptake was so large amongst you know yeah. we've been talking about with patient populations I, um i think <laughs> back to the institute of medicine study someone correct my numbers but you know how many people die a year because of medical errors uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, three, four hundred thousand. Certainly, it's close to a hundred thousand, at least. Yeah. It's it's in the hundred thousand number. Yeah. So, so Rosemary, I wanted to pick on you a little bit. Um, I know you're our, our guest for the show. You have this great book um, that I got a you know prescription of, and it's basically focusing on how women can lead 
the sort of the call and the march towards universal coverage. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ideas um, in that book? I know all of us, especially the men on the call, are, you know, really want to hear that. And, and I, I, I just think it's, it's time for that sort of work to be, you know, broadcast to all populations. Uh, absolutely. And um, yes, I focused on, on women uh, stepping up and, and really um, agitating for this solution because I, and it's not to say that men do not have a role, they certainly do. And as you know, a lot of the major strides we've had in healthcare coverage are thanks to male leadership, um, including, of course, um, Barack Obama, but there was also Nancy Pelosi, there was also Michelle Obama. So, but when I look at like where we are as a country vis a vis, the other um, advanced or you know wealthy countries, um, and the fact that we still haven't gotten there, we have not closed that final gap to get to universal health care, and they all the rest have. So what is it going to take? Because I've been working on this issue now for you know the better part of fifteen years, and uh, well actually longer, but anyway. And so, you know, looking at that and saying, okay, it's not going to come from corporate America and it's not, we're not getting there with the leadership that we have. Um, we, we only take these smaller incremental steps and yet, so, and then look at who carries the healthcare burden, you know, at the family um, level. Women make 80% of family-based healthcare decisions and somebody else coined the term, oh, well, they're the chief medical officer of their homes. It's like, great. But, you know, when I think chief medical officer, I think of people with power and big companies. <laughs> and I don't see individual women in their homes having, you know, power writ large, unless collectively we come together and say enough is enough. We have got to address this. And so I really, it's a call to action at a, at a grassroots democracy level. And going back to the, you know, the personal is political kind of mantra, from the feminist movement in the 60s and 70s, it's like saying that again. And for me, you know, the the tipping point was the election outcome in 2016, where all of the um, the Republican males who won were campaigning vociferously on repealing the Affordable Care Act. For me, that was happening at the exact same time I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And literally heard some of the men saying, why are we even paying for mammograms? And I'm thinking, are you serious? Do you not have a, a mother or a wife or a somebody for whom like you actually care about? Yeah. It, it just, it, I kind of got to this level of outrage and I thought, okay, um, yeah, I'm a policy wonk, but we've just got to combine all this and close that gap for once and for all. As I said earlier, we're a wealthy country. We can do this. So why haven't we? I, you know, I, I've participated in that first women's, actually I've done all the women's marches, but that first one in Washington, D.C. that was frankly worldwide was unbelievable in terms of that peaceful coming together and feeling the power when people want to make positive change. And so then it's like, can we keep harnessing that and move forward and get this country to really where it should be? I love and your message. Well, the pandemic only makes it more important. I wrote this before the pandemic and I thought it was essential. Now it's like order of magnitude, more essential in terms of where our priorities should be. And I don't want to burden women more, but frankly, they already are burdened. And so I have a whole bunch in the book about how activism can be a salve, that you come together with other people. You're not alone in what you're struggling with. And that's really a, you know, a number of the points I'm making. As one other piece, I'll just say, um, when I wrote this, there was an awful lot of talk about Medicare for all, um, thanks to Bernie Sanders. and and putting out there, you know, very strongly the idea that healthcare should be a right in this country, but it got conflated with that as if like the only way to get there is Medicare for all. And in my book, I really wanted to show that there are multiple paths. And so I was just afraid that we would see like what we saw with Clinton healthcare reform, that that would just be too much to digest and we would get a reaction to that and possibly even a setback. And so I wanted to illustrate, um, you know, in, in lay terms for people to give them more talking points about other paths that don't necessarily mean uh, completely making it a government run solution. Right. Sort of like a stepwise instead of, cause I know that it was either, it was either 
universal coverage or bust. It's kind of like the Bernie bust gang. So um, I know you even had a piece again on TFCB that kind of walks readers through a little bit of how, you know, we can achieve it through these very different methods. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit about what you were saying about intersectionality, and I know we only have a few minutes left, but sort of not being alone in this cause, right? As, as women, as mothers, as sisters, as wives, whatever, you know, how we exist in the healthcare uh, communities, you know, we're, like you said, we're making 80 to 85% of the decisions in households. 51% um, of the population is female. So it's kind of like where, how do you empower yourself in the system, you know, entering it, let's say, as a grandmother, as a mother, as a new mom, you know, as a, just, just somebody who's, you know, in her 20s or 30s, how, how do you empower yourself without feeling so alone? Um, so I'll throw out one other statistic. Women are also responsible for 100% of the future population. <laughs> I can't take credit for that, but I, when somebody said that when I was on a panel, I thought, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, but I, so I have a, I have a um, quiz people can take on my website, rosemarieday.com, that's an activism assessment, and it gives people kind of where they are in the degrees of activism, um, and there's no judgment there, it's just kind of like, let's see where you are, and then how do you step, take a step out of that, you know, if that's your comfort zone, how do we stretch you from wherever your starting point is, and then I give you places to go, regard, you know, for whatever um, flavor of thing you would like and whatever generation you're in. Um, so there's groups like Moms Rising and others that are very much giving folks vehicles for grassroots participation, even in this time where a lot of that has to be done virtually. So there's, there's really easy ways for people to plug in. And there, these groups are trying hard to establish community since we can't get together as much in person. But can we do things like this, looking at each other and having talking circles and, and then moving that towards advocacy? That's great. I'll be sure to drop that link also in our bio and the post so people can get access to that. I really want to take that quiz now too uh, to see where, where you know, because a lot of, a lot of obviously, you know, in this new generation, it's either this or that. And if there's this, like I was, what I started with, there's all these extremes. And then yeah. when you don't fall into that extreme, you're kind of like, oh, um, I'm not sure. But as soon as you say, I'm not sure, it's a rain on how you don't know anything, how you're uneducated, illiterate, ignorant. Yeah. All I don't, and that, that's going to keep a lot of people out. And we need everybody involved, if, you know. Uh, if we're going to actually have the movement to, to close that gap for once and for all. So, yeah, I, I really respect you start from where you are, you lead from where you are. Yeah, and, and hopefully that, that transitions into the, the election coming up, which we need everybody on board for, <laughs> regardless of where anybody stands, which we, I'm yeah. just going to leave it at that. Um, but I know we just have a few. Devin, did you want to say something before we wrap? No, no, I actually, I'm looking at the quiz. Sorry. <laughs> um, so um, with that, I know we just have a few more minutes left. I know we had some technical difficulties, so this wasn't as long. Um, but I kind of want to just go around the circle, everybody's final thoughts um, in terms of what everybody is seeing um, and what everybody hopes from the future with all the kind of the topics we covered today. Um, so Devin, why don't I start with you and then, and then do the quiz. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'll, I'll get to it. I also, there was, um, a fi uh, fire trucks outside. So that's, I went off mute until on mute until they stopped sirens. So that's great, Devin, you're still in the Bay as well, right? Yes, yeah. I am. Despite the fact that it looks like I'm in an office, I'm actually sitting at my dining room table. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, this is, it'll be in, as we inch closer and closer to the election in November, it's just going to be fascinating to see more. We didn't, we didn't ha find time to talk about this sort of communications issues around the administration and censoring MMWR, which is like the, you know, the ultimate sin from a public health researcher um, and practitioner standpoint. So I, I don't look forward to more of this controversy and this churn, but it's coming. 
And it's, and as we, again, get closer and closer to the election, there's more and more pressure to put out treatments and vaccines probably sooner than they're ready. It's, it's going to be, I think, incumbent on, on, science, on the scientists and those of us who believe in science to continue to hold the administration's feet to the fire and to keep an eye on this stuff. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Grace, what about you? Uh, definitely going to be carefully following the science on vaccine protocols. There was an adverse event, event that was reported. There's a halting of trials for AstraZeneca. And now what are, what's this going to look forward? There's been a big call by the scientific and medical community to have sponsors and pharma companies and developers post more information, provide more transparency about their clinical trials, their design and their protocols. I'm looking forward to seeing more data and, and more fact. Yeah, and, you know, definitely. I, I saw the clinical trial. It was, I mean, it's, and they're not even releasing a lot of the information that went wrong there. So it's a little bit contentious. Um, Kim? Well, like like uh, Devin and Grace, uh, this, the war between the administration and the CDC is just, there's no good that com comes of it. Between the Michael Caputo stuff with the M MMWR and then the latest battle between Redfield and Trump. My, I think we're making record progress with vaccines, but I, my fear is that when they come out, many people will not trust them. And I think for good reason, because there are going to be concerns about whether they were rushed or not. So I, I think this, this, it's a terrible development and it's going to undermine the American healthcare system for some time to come. Mm -hmm. Vince, what about you? I'll be real concise. Uh, please vote. Uh, please vote early. And please don't vote often. <laughs> that was one of the best summaries I've heard. <laughs> Thank you, Vince. Is, is that it? Anything else? That's it. That's it. So we all heard Vince vote and don't vote often. <laughs> um, Rosemary, what about you to just close it off? So... I think for all the suffering we're going through with this pandemic and I'd say the leadership crisis around that, I would like to hope, um, I am going to hope, continue hoping that we'll take this crisis and turn it into the opportunity to make some fundamental shifts in how um, we're, you know, in our public policy and to provide universal health care, to think about the safety net far more, to reduce disparities, all of these things which are just becoming so amplified as problems of our society because of the pandemic. So I will also conclude by saying, ah, vote. That's my sign, vote. Love it so much, that's great. Um, so my final thoughts as Devin and I are reporting from the Bay, we saw the orange skies, we saw the red sun. Um, I'm really intrigued to see exactly how environmental factors and healthcare decisions are all playing into the upcoming election just with, um, you know, the Green New Deal not being passed um, or, you know, people, again, with the universal health coverage with, for just, you know, vulnerable populations. How is all of sort of these really big and as well as the, with a pandemic right so in in california you couldn't go outside and you you had to stay inside you go outside there's COVID and there's a fire and you have to stay inside and then you're already you know very isolated so then people's mental health problems start i mean it's just this exponentiating cause which exactly what you said rosemary there's a leadership there's a very there's a staggering lack of leadership in all dimensions and so um my to my entire generation of people please don't be bernie and bus please go vote um you know just just get out there we really need everybody's help in this um and so with that that has been our episode 25 of thcb gang thank you again so much for joining me again we had kim bellard you can catch him at on twitter at kim b bellard um, grace cordovano patient advocate check her out at grace cordovano rosemary day we heard from her she has an amazing website which we'll be dropping into again the link on youtube and our spotify channels as well as the post please go take that that look that sounds like an amazing survey that we can all learn a lot from thank you so much rosemary for joining us vince caretas you know coming out of 
again his optimistic angle always on these on these game calls thank you so much and Devin McGraw out here with me in the bay you can catch out health privacy thank you so much join us again next week um, when we're hopefully back on live um, you know on from 1 p.m to 4 p.m et and with that that has been thcb gang thank you so much catch you next week <laughs>